is configuration space. This is space time. And um, here's the um, ball's trajectory right there. <coughs> uh, your graph is carefully marked with the uh, coordinates and coordinate versus time. <coughs> so you probably didn't make the same mistake I did at this point. But then coming down here and running into the ball is the pin. Okay, so there we go. Okay, so collision. Now you have to know what velocities uh, we got uh, from uh, the uh, collision, uh, assuming the collision is independent. These motions are independent. It's just two things running into each other in space uh, at, at that moment. So the next step on this thing is to use that uh, thing. Now, the question, of course, is what is the answer to that? And that's where you have to look at what we just did here and, and producing a uh, 7 to 1 uh, collision winding up here with a velocity of 2.5. So we're going to have to be drawing a line with a slope of 2.5 uh, right there. I'll go ahead and advance uh, these two uh, here to that point. Okay. So, uh, and when we get done with having something go at 2.5, we're also going to be having, as we uh, did have with this particular uh, case uh, right here, we're going to be having uh, uh, the lower mass, the one that's not going to be going so fast, this 2.5, um, sort of making the dot here bigger. Remember when I came through the first time, I got a little high there. But in any case, the answer is right in the center of that black square. Uh, 0.5 is the uh, velocity uh, measured by this coordinate right here, and 2.5 is the velocity measured from here, 1, 2, 0.5. So uh, that, those are the, the final coordinates, and we just simply have to draw lines with those slopes from that point. First, uh, this one with a slope of 0.5, 1 half, uh, there, and then this one with a slope of 2.5, which hits the ceiling, and then you have to know where the ceiling is, and that's what we're going to be doing in the next few days, is working out collisions that involve a whole bunch of balls running into each other inside a, a container, a, a, an air track, or a superconducting track. Okay, so that, that's the order of the next uh, few days, but we're going to uh, take it a little bit further uh, right here. Because the other thing we'd like to see is um, what, does the vol what does it look like in velocity, velocity space? That's what, uh, I'm sorry, in space space, what does it actually look like uh, there? This is velocity, velocity, there's space, space, and then there's space, time. So those are the three things that classical mechanics works with. Three ways to represent what's happening in any situation. We've only got two things here, each with one dimension, one degree of freedom. So you can imagine that it gets really complicated when you have already two degrees of freedom for each of them. That's four-dimensional space. And that's hard to visualize, really hard. We're getting better at it using computers. But five dimensions, six dimensions, and so forth, okay. There's a lot to do yet. There's a lot to do uh, uh, to um, play games like this that are geometrical with um, complicated mechanics. In any case, this is a situation that we just saw a little bit of the beginning of. The idea that after we've had one, this comes back down off of the ceiling, that's pretty easy. You just turn the slopes from plus to, plus to minus, so positive slope. Whatever that was, 2.5, this is going to be minus 2.5. And this guy right here, uh, he takes off. And they run into each other at that point. And then you have to do another one of these uh, right here. That is, we did the uh, thing that brought us up <coughs> to uh, this point right here. That was the first uh, uh, thing drawn right through there. Okay. 
So there's 0 0.5, 2.5, 2, 2 is right here, 2.5 right there, okay? Then that bounces off the ceiling, okay? And that's why I had to make a bigger graph over there to show that. That's the next stop uh, after this, um, this uh, uh, occurs. <coughs> and um, the velocity, velocity plots that, that we uh, need to draw are uh, going to be determined uh, by uh, <coughs> this value. And then, and here's the problem, if that's the, uh, the uh, velocity space that this thing is in, I've got to go all the way from here to, well, I'm off the board, you see. So I had to do a smaller one over there. So um, what I would have you do now is just reproduce this, the part that we're interested in uh, over here. Um, we'll draw an arrow like we did uh, here that indicates the first a collision that involves only the ball and the floor. So we'll assume that's perfect. It completes right there. It has a certain velocity of it's just a negative of the negative. That's a positive one of velocity right there. And then we do uh, on this graph the same thing. You don't have to do this because you already have a graph that goes out one and then up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then does it again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Did I get that right? One, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? And I do it again here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there is the uh, next velocity on this uh, reduced scale graph, but it makes it a, a graph that can cover the entire uh, realm that these uh, two objects are going to be able to go. Let's get this thing to draw a nice line through there. Okay, so this is another velocity uh, right here. And then it's going to hit, um, see if I've got that right. Yeah, so there is the uh, coordinate 0.5 velocity for the heavy object, the, pen, the ball. And then here is 2.5. That's 2.5 right there. Okay? Now, that 2.5 has to come out to minus 2.5 after it hits the ceiling. So th this is the case where these objects are confined on both the top and the bottom by a ceiling and a floor. So the next uh, stop here is way down here. I don't need to um, be very careful about this because we know the answer is right here. So this is going to be an arrow that comes all the way down to there. Still has an a abscissa coordinate, horizontal coordinate of 0.5, but this is minus 0.5. Okay, so following the path, this collision path is across here, up to there, down to there. Okay. Now each of those, um, each of those stopping points, collision points or endpoints of collisions. Okay, have velocities associated with them. Velocity vectors. I'm going to use a slightly different colored chalk here to indicate them. Uh, sort of a blue here to draw this one. There's an arrow going right here that's very important. This is a velocity vector in the particle space, the 1, 2 space. Pen, I'm sorry, ball. Pen, SUV, VW, whatever. So there, there's uh, one vector uh, that's of interest. And of course, the vector that we had before 
Uh, this hem will draw a slightly different color here, sort of a green. This is the setup for the actual collision between the two. The throws a little one so high. Okay. And then when we're done uh, here, there's another blue vector right here. Okay, so these are all things that you should add to your graph in order to make use of what's coming. And that is simply a way to track in this space, I'm sorry, this space right here, uh, where things are. And th this is quite spectacular when you, uh, you, get to, you, get to, you get to use the computer to do that. But it's, um, it's quite, quite interesting. So um, <clears throat> I want to go ahead. We've got about 15 minutes left here in which I can uh, discuss that. Uh, before I do, though, let me remind you for the problem that you're uh, doing this do on um, <clears throat> the, fall, the next Wednesday, um, <clears throat> getting the, uh, the uh, major and minor, actually, this is the minor and that's the major in this case, uh, the, uh, get the, getting those um, radii of the ellipse, um, that is a, a key part of this because uh, once you've drawn the ellipse, and that's the thing that you should probably be noticing as we're drawing these graphs right here, is that all of these uh, endpoints, this is the most recent one, the one before that that we worked on so hard over here, and the one that we have right here, that is just a result of the ball bouncing, these all lie on the kinetic energy ellipse. So if any of your points are off of that ellipse that's already drawn, uh, there's an error. Okay? So you see, if you draw the ellipse, if you have a way to draw the ellipse, then it makes the geometry a lot easier because you just bounce around until there are lines hitting the ellipse. Now one of the things that I want to try to get to today is getting rid of the ellipse, getting the ellipse to be a circle. And that's something that's really unconventional, to say the least. And I'll let you be uh, talking about that. In any case, uh, I pointed out <coughs> that when you have uh, these collisions going on, and here's a, a good example of one, I'm going to go ahead and run it on this uh, machine here, see if I can get that, um, got a mouse here, I'm going to see if I can get that started. Um, <clears throat> this isn't going to be a Newtonian time plot. This is uh, just going to be the, I think, let's just see how it works out. Yeah, there we go. Bang over, bang up. That's how far we got. Okay? And the way this uh, program works is it stops uh, to s let you see the high point of this uh, second collision. And so what you want to do uh, to get it going again is hit resume, and that's the part that we're, we're, we're talking about now. And you can pause this thing at any place, but you can see that I've just had another collision that went all the way over to that point on the ellipse. So that's what we're getting, that's what we're trying to find, a, a, a decent way to get all of this structure. Now, to give you a little bit of historical context for this that Feynman told me about, <clears throat> and then later it was published, and, it, and it's, anybody does statistical mechanics has learned this terrible lesson. When the uh, Manhattan Project wound up, they had already a pretty good computer with anything like these things, but it, you know, it was something like it, it could hold, you know, it had a memory somewhere around the so many K, I think they are 128K or something like that. But it was enough to solve differential equations reasonably well. And so they started taking famous problems like uh, Fermi's, um, Fermi's mirror. There, there was something where you had a mirror that was just oscillating a sign and it had something that bounced back and forth. 
what they wanted to do was, was show that the fundamental axiom of statistical mechanics was that everything uh, becomes completely random very quickly was true. It turns out it's not true at all. And they started noticing that. They figured there's something wrong with the computer. It was making all these patterns that were anything but random. And you're going to see that with this as you play with it. You're going to see situations where it doesn't do this. That's called ergodic. I call it ergodic fill-in. All these lines here, uh, in certain situations, do pretty fi well fill this fairly quickly. But most of the time, it doesn't. It makes some kind of pattern. And that just blew their minds. It, it, you know, and that should have been the beginning of the chaos theory, but it wasn't. They, they just kind of dropped it until about 1980s when uh, some people revisited that. And then we had a whole um, area where uh, classical mechanics had to uh, deal with what we call chaotic systems and the patterns that it makes. So uh, we'll be able to do a little bit of that later on. In, this, in any case, this is a really simple way uh, to have that uh, available. <clears throat> so anytime you want, you just let this thing run. <clears throat> and what's uh, fairly obvious with most of the ratios that you pick, this is 7 to 1. Is there anything special about 7 to 1? Yes, there is. Just about every number has something special about it when you start talking about what's going on in you know, uh, uh, collisions uh, of this complexity. So. Uh, finally, we end up with quite a few lines in there, but after a while, it starts repeating. It starts going over the same lines, and that uh, makes a pattern that uh, uh, occurs. And the question is, well, why does it do that? Well, what, you know, this really bugged me as much as it bugged uh, guys like Fermi and Oblom Pasta and all those guys that were playing with his first computer back in 19. Uh, what well, was, I think, 48 and 49 when they started playing with these things. In any case, <clears throat> when you do all of this, you also get patterns in these other spaces, in space-time and in space-space. Uh, this is particularly interesting because <clears throat> it's really hard to make a quantum mechanical um, problem out of bouncing particles. But particles are weights. And so this, this little thing here that always stays on this side, um, at least in the first go around uh, of these uh, simulations that we're doing, it always uh, stays uh, on this side. This, this collision line comes together and they separate. They don't go through each other. But you can make them go through each other if you have a computer. And that's what we have. So uh, you're going to be seeing some of that. In any case, uh, the, the, uh, <coughs> the pictures that we're going to be uh, looking at uh, fairly sh uh, shortly here involve, uh, in this case I'm talking about <coughs> a mass ratio of 7 squared. Uh, that's 49, I've got 49 to 1 ratio. So what I get is a 7 to 1 ratio of ellipse uh, major to minor uh, axis uh, for that. And um, this, this is, uh, first of all, quite beautiful just from its basic uh, behavior at the beginnings of the uh, motion. Let's see if I can, what I, what I want to get to is uh, coming here fairly quickly, but um, there I see the, the click right here. Um, it's due 40 line uh, to one, uh, <clears throat> first of all, Newtonian time plot. Let's see if I can get that to, to work. Oop, I didn't, because I didn't get a little hand to show. This is a little tricky here. I have to get on that, not that one, but that one. I think that is the first one. It's just for some reason much better. Maybe you're right. Let me just go ahead and see what we get here. Oh, okay, we get both. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so this is. This is the behavior that you know we're very familiar with. But now our line slope, 49 to 1, is practically straight up and down. And it's that, that kind of picture that I was 
um, sketched in the beginning of these lectures that we haven't really talked about, but um, when you have a big ratio, then this guy here has to be hit many times before he turns around. And then he does. Take that. And then he comes back. And now, um, they're very close to this line, this 45 degree line, very close velocities. And then it does it all over again. So it's the pattern that lives in that squinchy little ellipse. It's pretty complicated. That's what we're going to spend some time with in the, uh, on next, uh, next Wednesday when we have the next class after this. But here's something else I want you to uh, see, and I'm going to pause this right here, and point out that there's a whole control panel for all of these things, and there's also all sorts of scenarios uh, that you can play with, all, all of the various things that we're going to be showing at different times during the course that involve uh, collisions of mul multiple numbers of particles are all available here for you to mess with. Uh, but uh, the thing that I want to show right here, instead of plotting velocity versus velocity, I want to do this plot that we started to make here, which is space versus space. The configuration space, coordinate space, where you would put a wave function if this was the quantum mechanical uh, problem. Okay, so let's go ahead and start that with everything the same. And now what I would like to do in order to finish this is increase the scale. So I'm going to uh, pause here. I'm going to go back to the controls. And I'm going to get my scale for the time constant. And help me a little bit here, TC. I seem to have forgotten uh, where that would be. Move lower. It's right at the bottom of the page. You might need to scroll. Tmax. There, there. One line down to your right. Down here. Now, now you got to go up. Oh, okay. Right under the, the word, right under plot range, to your right. To the right? T-max. Oh, here we go. Okay, let's take it from and just six of disappears our unit moment. seconds to uh, four or five times that. Let's try this. That ought to be good enough. Okay. Go ahead and start it. Okay. So now, big time for this to be <coughs> uh, carried out. Okay, bang, bang, and it's picking up speed, and finally gets it turned around. And says one last clunk. <laughs> and now they go up about the same speed, not quite the same, but pretty close. And this whole thing begins over again, except it's now a little higher. Whoa! It's really getting pounded by like that. Now later on in chapter 6 of our unit, this is where we first introduced the idea of a force and a potential. Only the potential is created by very fast motion of something that's very light. In other words, this is a one-dimensional thermodynamics a, of a gas, a gas with one atom that causes pressure on the object that's impinging on that atom. Okay, we're going to use that as our model, as the simplest possible model of a gas. Oils, law, all that kind of stuff comes out of mechanics and you get it in a, in a very uh, beautiful way. So that um, and now it's just about time to finish here. I do want to uh, show a couple of things here. I'm going to escape and go back to the lectures and find uh, a couple of things that I um, thought maybe I would have time to show here, but maybe I, I'm not. Um, so we are going a little bit slower than we have in the past, and I think that's good. Perhaps in just the last few uh, minutes here, oh, yeah, space, space if there are any questions, yes? Can you run the space-space plot? 
Yeah, uh, that I would be glad to do, yeah. Let's go ahead and try that. Um, to do that. Uh, if you still got your browser up, we can do it in the control panel. We can do it uh, just right here. Just take this one. Well, it should be still loaded in your browser. That'll work. Yeah. Okay, now let's just straight away change it. Control. Let's pause and here and do the what you're talking that about. That one up. That one right there. there. Plot the Y's. One down. This way. Yeah. Okay. Coordinates versus coordinates. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's too close to it. I can so, see it better than him right here. <laughs> let's go ahead and see what it does. Yeah. This is this space that we're uh, drawing. Um, <coughs> Uh, started to draw the wrong thing. The thing is at the bottom there. So that that this is what you're getting in the space versus space. What you have to deal with uh, there. So uh, let's resume. This is spectacular so with this ratio. <laughs> caught in the corner there, so to speak. Then comes out not quite along the liner went in on. Now the way Fermi also, uh, Fermi, Pasta, and Ulu uh, did their computer things was the, the balls didn't have any uh, size, they were all particles. And um, that one, the scaling needs to be a little bit adjusted there. It does a whole bunch of stuff up in the corner there and it comes out. You can do that on this thing by just simply reducing the radius of the uh, balls uh, to make them particles. So they actually come up to the uh, line here instead of having a, a, a gap that's the sum of the radii of these two objects. And then you, you get some of the behavior that two, two atoms in a linear box uh, uh, do. Uh, as the time goes on. And the patterns are quite amazing that uh, are made just by that simple system. So we'll be looking at uh, that sort of uh, behavior. But the other thing that we still have to do is a new way to handle the kinetic energy. And the kinetic energy right now is a function of velocity. That's called a Lagrangian. Whenever any uh, energy function as, as an independent variable of velocity to the Lagrangian. The Hamiltonian, that's the sort of the opposite. Their momentum is the independent variables. Halfway between there, something I call the Sanji, it doesn't have a name. I could be a conceited guy and name it the Hartarian or something, but I'm not going to do that. I call it the the, the, Trondian, the, str the Stranger. And it's a circle instead of ellipse. The ellipse that we're dealing with now is a long one this way, the Hamiltonian is a long one this way, and between there is circle, and the circle makes the geometry really trivial. So you can follow these kind of crazy motions uh, very, not, very much more easily. So that's the thing we'll be talking about very beginning on Wednesday. And I wish you a good Labor Day weekend. Stay cold. <laughs>